And we are back. One more episode of The Horror Guys. Hi again. It's number 163, yes? It is. And I'm Kevin. And I'm Brian. And we're going to talk about some horror movies. Did you see some horror movies? I saw some horror movies. So did I. I should... We saw four horror movies and, and a, a short, short film. We should talk about them. Yeah. This week we've got... I think the newest one we've got is called Hellblazers. Mm-hmm. It, they raided the retirement home for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Bring back all the classics. Yeah. And then we got uh, The Last Radio Call. Actually, that was a, a brand new one, too. That was a 2022. 2022 yeah. yeah. And we're going to watch the classic Horror Express from 1972 and Howling 3, which is some kind, sometimes known as Howling 3, The Marsupials. And that was uh, 1987. And we got a short film, as always. And before we get into those, we want to talk about our two bonus films this week that you can get to by signing up for our newsletter at HorrorBulletin.com. And this week we watched Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth. He's back again. It was still good. Yeah, I know that that series Mm -hmm. went way downhill as it went along, but 3 was still pretty good. Yep. yep. 1 was best, 2 was very good, 3 is decent. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't and, remember four. We're going to have to see four pretty soon. Well, they, they start heading downhill, I think. Yeah, I think so, too. Mm-hmm. And, of course, The Lair of the White Worm from 1988. And that one's just great. That is just weird. <laughs> it's great and weird. <laughs> it's yeah. weird, yes. Mm-hmm. If you haven't seen that one, you need to see that one. And the uh, Horror Bulletin Monthly Magazine just came out today as we record this. Issue number seven. And, again, you can go to horrorguys.com. And choose monthly, and you can pick up all seven back issues if you want. And did you know that we wrote some short stories, too? We yeah. have Tales to Make You Shiver, Volumes 1 and 2, our collection of short stories. And there's a link to those in the show notes. And someday we're going to have a Volume 3. We I keep promise. saying that. we got to write <laughs> stories first. <laughs> but, speaking of stories, mm-hmm. back in 1972... There was a train ride. Yeah, and these two guys that had never worked together, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. Well, like, okay, they'd made like 40 what? movies what? together they'd by never this worked point. Before. <laughs> <laughs> well, it had Telly Savalas in it, which was kind of different. It was, yeah. Horror Express, 1972, directed by Eugenio Martin, written by Arnaud Disso and Julian Zeme. This I'm getting the impression it's not an American-made somewhat film. Somewhat European-sounding. Oh, it certainly is. The poster is uh, Panico in... L.S. Trans-Siberiano. Panic and L.S. <laughs> Trans-Siberiano. Panic on the Trans-Siberian. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Stars Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, Telly Savalas, Alberto Di Mendoza, and Sylvia Tortosa. Hour 28 minutes. Link in the show notes for a trailer if you don't know what this is about. And the spoiler-free judgment zone says... It's a good and fun horror film, helped a great deal by performances from Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, and Telly Savalas, Telly Savalas uh, as well as a good overall cast. It's one you don't want to think about too deeply, though. There are some plot holes and bad science. Oh, boy. Yeah, and it's a pretty abrupt ending, but all in all, we still give it a thumbs up. Bad science? You oh. mean a million-year-old mummy alive on a train, and he knows how to do all these things? Oh, and, and the things with people's brains and memories and, yeah, and just, yeah. Yeah. Bad, bad science. It's got some issues. <laughs> yeah. but, but it's a good movie. But it is, yeah. It's overall, fun. It's, it's fun and entertaining. And Telly Savalas in it. I mean, he's, he's just a wacko. <laughs> yeah, Chewing the scenery. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We begin in China in 1906. Sir Alexander Saxton narrates his failed expedition. He and his men explore a cave system up in the snow-covered mountains. He finds an old mummy frozen in the ice. They pack it up and carry it down to civilization where it's loaded onto a train bound for Russia. It turns out that expedition was the easy part. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, he starts about talking about how the expedition failed, and, you know, I'm expecting some big disaster then. He's talking about the whole thing being his expedition. Yeah. Which ended up not going so well. Dr. Wells meets up with him as he boards the train. Saxton isn't particularly happy to see Wells. While they argue about the tickets, a local thief tries to break into the package and dies in the attempt. Father Pujardov, a guy who seems to be channeling Rasputin, calls it the work of the devil. The box is very obviously sealed with a chain and strong padlock, but the train finally departs. There's a lot of talking before we get going. Mm -hmm. Gotta set things up. Sexton tells Wells that his fossil inside is more than two million years old. Natasha asks Sexton about the box, but he's vague about the contents. 
She's from Poland and finds English people fascinating. Wells pays one of the porters to drill a hole in the box after dark to see what's inside. Saxton and Wells turn up to to be unexpected roommates. Natasha demands to stay in her room as she can't afford her own ticket. How do you get on a train with no ticket? She also admits that she's an international spy. Wait, what? She's sneaky. She's She's an international spy and doesn't even have have a ticket? All right. (laughs) She snuck on board. The porter drills the hole in the box as instructed. As soon as he leaves for other things, the mummy reaches out and picks the lock with a bent nail. His eyes glow red and the porter dies. The mummy seems to like to whistle a little tune. The Count and Countess talk to Father Pujardov, whom they have brought along as a guest and spiritual advisor. The inspector calls Sexton and Wells about the missing baggage man, and Sexton is ordered to open the box. Sexton throws the key out the window rather than open it, so they break in. Inside, they find the baggage man's body. Oops. Sexton says his two-million-year-old monkey-man hybrid mummy is alive on the train. Wait, what? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) For some reason, the inspector chooses not to believe this. It is a little far-fetched, yeah. The inspector asks Wells to do an autopsy on the dead baggage man. He saws open the dead man's head with a hacksaw. The man's brain has no wrinkles, which he says means the man's memories have been drained away. That's not how that works. That's not how that works. (laughs) Natasha asks Sexton if his fossil killed the man, and he says, yeah, probably. In a very matter-of-fact way. He doesn't really care. A little later, Natasha goes to the freight car to open her safe, and the mummy kills her as well. Wells and the inspector encounter the mummy, and the inspector shoots it dead before he passes out himself. The autopsy on Natasha shows a smooth brain as well. Sexton thinks the mummy was able to absorb other people's minds and memories, including their education. They find out that they can see the creature's own memories by looking at his eyes under a microscope. You know, because if you look at a dead man's mm. eyes, you can see the last thing he saw. Mm-hmm. In video. Uh-huh. Sure. The creature seems to have come from outer space way back in the time of the dinosaurs. Yeah, they had to get that explanation in there. Yeah. Somehow. Father Pujardov contr- confronts the inspector, and he asks like he knows something. The inspector has been acting a little strangely since his encounter with a now-dead mummy. Pujardov calls it the Eye of Satan and steals the mummy's eye. He hides in the freight car where he sees the inspector steal Mrs. Jones's mind just like the mummy had been doing. The inspector, <gasps> he is the mummy. Oh, shapeshifter. Pujardov offers, offers the eye to the inspector who simply burns it. Pujardov offers to serve the inspector as his willing servant. Sexton and Wells start to examine the passenger's eyes. That doesn't turn up anything. The inspector asks the engineer about overcoming gravity, and since it's 1906, the, ins- the engineer says they can't do much about gravity right now. <laughs> no, no, they okay. can't. Yeah. The inspector then sucks out the engineer's knowledge. Captain Kazan, Telly Savalas, is waiting at the next train station, and we see that he's very weird, but he's good at his job. He's very bombastic. Oh yeah, he's something. And he, and he brings some troops with him. <laughs> We're going to have order on this train. Sexton explains his theory to the inspector that the alien was only using the mummy as a host and has now moved on to someone else. Kazan and his soldiers board the train to find out who the killer is. Kazan whips Pujardov until he passes out. The beatings will begin till the confessions occur. That's right. All right, both Kazan and Sexton start to suspect the inspector is the creature. There is a quick battle and the inspector is killed. The creature then goes into Pujardov. Somehow, Pujardov gets behind the soldiers and kills them all, Kazan included. Because they show him going out one door, Mm -hmm. and then he comes in the door behind them. This is a train. How does that happen? Yeah. Yeah. Don't think about that too much. The passengers panic, but Sexton and Wells grab a gun and go after the monster themselves. Pujardov confronts the Count and kills him. Sexton comes in, and the creature explains everything. He was accidentally left behind before there was even life on Earth. So he's E.T., basically. He offers to teach humanity how to end disease and hunger if only Sexton would let him go. Elsewhere on the train, all the dead bodies get up. He can control them like zombies. Suddenly, in the last 15 minutes, it becomes a zombie movie. Mm -hmm. Sexton and the Countess fight them off and run to the rear of the train. 
They disconnect their car from the rest of the train, which leaves them behind as they coast free. The, the front of the train falls off a cliff because someone in Moscow knew what was happening and ordered the track to be switched to the side track that goes right off a cliff. Because that's a thing that all trains should have. A side track that goes off a cliff. Just Always. in case. Yeah, just in just case. case. You, you never know when that. you're going to need that. Mm-hmm. The car with all the passengers coasts to a stop just inches from the cliff. Happy ending for all the survivors. Like, mm. both of them. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, how does a two-million-year-old mummy know how to pick a lock? He's probably never even seen metal before. He absorbed knowledge. From who? This was before he absorbed anybody. He was just a mummy in a box. He's really smart. <laughs> The external, uh, if you've never seen a lock before, how do you mm. pick a lock if you've never seen one before? Why would you even think it was possible? I think he picked up some knowledge somewhere. All right. Yeah. And and I don't think it's noted anywhere here. Uh, I, I didn't realize until this viewing and then reading about it that the thing from another world, uh-huh. his original story, Campbell's original story, this is also based off that loosely. More, more loosely than Thing from Another World. And, a Thing from and Another thing World landed movies. in the ice, got frozen, woke up, and started mm-hmm. taking people over. Yeah, the, okay, I can see it. Yeah, this is this is inspired from that, from his story. A very loose outline. Loose, loosely, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. The external shots of the train show four passengers' car and one freight car at the end. Some shots show more, some less. They're clearly not the same train. We see a bunch of different interiors, however, so this train may be bigger on the inside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're very inconsistent there. There are decent performances from both Lee and Cushing, and oh boy, can Telly Savalas chew the scenery. Yeah, yeah he did. He, <laughs> he puts on a show. The ending, though. How did Moscow have any idea what was even happening on board the train? There was no telegram or nothing. You know, I mean, they no, no communication that they had with Moscow. Well, first of all, the captain came on board the train to find out who the murderer was. How did, he, how did he even know there was a murder? Yeah, good question. Okay. Well, why was the railroad built to allow a train to drive off a cliff? <laughs> yeah, the ending was very rushed and kind of out of the blue, but overall, it is a fun horror film. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A thumbs up overall. It was good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then 1987... The Howling had been a super success. Oh, and another side note, too. Uh-huh. Uh, there's an issue, uh, There's a, uh episode of Black Mirror. Was it Black Mirror? Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. The, uh, uh, you know, futuristic uh, science fiction series. Um, wh- wh- what channel runs that? It's a cable streaming. I think Showtime. Showtime. I'm not sure. I'm yeah. not absolutely sure. But anyway, one of the episodes of Black Mirror, he invents a kind of a, a simulation machine where he can go into movies. A, a movie. Yeah. And the guy that invents it, he's obsessed with one of the characters from this movie and goes into it to live it like a VR. So that episode of the, the, the TV show is like half of this movie. Yeah, yeah. That was neat. But it's different. It's kind of neat. Yeah, they made it different because he goes in and he interferes with the story by being in it. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a very interesting episode. Yeah, yeah. We're checking out if you can find that. All right, so we had the super successful Howling movie that kind of reinvigorated werewolf movies. Mm-hmm. I've been watching a lot of werewolf movies lately. I'm we, just saying. We have, just yeah. Saying. There, might, there could be a book coming up, I think. It could be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but Howling 2 was not as good. And then they made... But they made money. So uh, they made a Howling so, 3. So they made more money by going to Australia this time for the marsupial version of... <laughs> I wonder how much connection this really had to the first two films, other than the title. They might have fudged it after the fact a little, I think. Somebody made like a werewolf movie Mm -hmm. in Australia and said, you know. You know, we could wedge this into the Howling series. Yeah. Yeah. So we have the Howling 3, The Marsupials from 87. Mm -hmm. Directed by Philip Mora. Written by Gary Brandener and Philippe Mora. Stars Barry Otto, Max Fairchild, and Imogen Ansley. Hour 34 minutes. Trailer in the show notes. And if you like the first two Howling movies, this ain't nothing like those. Well, it's different. It's yeah. different. It's yeah. good. We have a spoiler-free judgment zone. What sort of happens? Well, it says the terror continues, but this could be a standalone movie. Um, it really has so little to do with the first two. It's Australian werewolves this time instead of American and European, a different species that evolved separately, parallel. And it's very scientifically explained, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's there's good science in this. <laughs> okay, there's lots of medicine and bad science. But it's a dumb kind of entertaining, and it moves pretty well. 
Overall, it is. overall, you know, a worthy watch. It was better than expected. Yes, yes, yes. it was. In 1905 Australia, we see the natives poking a strange animal that they've killed. Also, in Siberia, we see a man is killed there, too. Today, at the National Intelligence Agency, they're tracking a monster that killed three people. We ain't here to track werewolves in Russia, one guy whines. Well, Professor Pe- Beckmeyer gives a lecture about the ultra-realistic wolf mask seen in the Australian film we saw from 1905. It wasn't a mask. No, it wasn't. He thinks it was. This time, we get to see them stabbing the wolf-faced creature while it was still alive. He then flies to Washington and tells the president that, hey, werewolves exist. We can't do anything about the Russian werewolves, but Beckmeyer says they also have them in Australia, and those would be much easier to study. Mm -hmm. Beckmeyer goes to Australia for more evidence. Just so you're sure, they show us the Sydney Opera House in four different shots, just to establish that, yeah, this is Australia, if you didn't know. (laughs) He meets up with Professor Sharp, a local expert. A bunch of dirty people in rags attacked a girl named Jerboa, who runs away from home. Apparently, a lot of the werewolves in Australia still live in the Stone Age. Later that night, we see that she is some kind, some kind of a werewolf. The next morning, Donnie, a casting agent, literally chases her across town. To, he's very dedicated to his job. And very persistent. Yeah, she sees him, he sees her, she sees him watching, and she runs away because she thinks she's some kind of crazy stalker, and then he stalks her, like, for miles through town. Wait, wait, I want to hire you. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so anyway, he he offers her a role in his shapeshifter movie. When he takes her to the movie set, we soon see see that the Australians of the 80s were very, very, very strange people. I don't know, maybe they still are. It is Australia, after all. (laughs) Jerboa looks at the werewolf actors on set and says that's not what the werewolves really look like. I'll show you later, she promises. She tells Donnie later, during sex, that the full moon doesn't have anything to do with change. He notices that she has a big horizontal scar on her belly. Three nuns come to town, and they're obviously wolves in disguise. Beckmeyer wants to track down the aboriginal werewolf, and his friend points out that a Russian ballerina recently defected there. Because there are werewolves in Russia, it's only logical that she should know about them, right? Sure, I see that connection. Oh, you're Russian. Mm -hmm. Hey, do you know about the werewolves? (laughs) (laughs) The three were-nuns come into the director's party that night, but Jerboa has already run off. Jerboa runs away from Donnie and gets hit by a car. They take her to the hospital, and the doctor thinks she might be an alien. Beckmeyer is alerted, and he comes to the hospital. This is exactly what he's been waiting for. Beckmeyer and Sharp examine her, and that scar is actually a pouch, like on a kangaroo. Marsupials. They also think she might be pregnant. The nuns wait outside the hospital until Beckmeyer and Sharp leave. When the nuns come in, all the doctors and hospital staff are killed. We soon see that the military is listening in on all this. Jerboa and the nuns return to the small Mad Max-like town that she came from originally. Remember the brief mention of the ballerina? Olga the ballerina is worried about changing during her performance. She's a werewolf. Her man... Funny that, huh? What a coincidence. Her manager seems to be telepathic, leading her to a drawing of Thilo, the man in charge of Mad Max Land. Beckmeyer and Sharp are in the audience for their rehearsal, and she does, in fact, change into a werewolf right in the middle of the dance. Awkward. The doctors take her into custody, just like they did with Jerboa, and that goes badly, too. Donnie and the other main characters all come to the small town of Flo out in the outback. And you see this big sign up in the sky, F-L-O-W, Flo. You know what Flo backwards And then they go to the other side of the sign, and they see what the sign says backwards. Mm -hmm. This is where Jerboa told Donnie she was from. Jerboa goes into the barn and gives birth to a little mousy-looking thing that crawls into her pouch and hides there. Meanwhile, Olga and Thilo finally get together. They're soulmates or something like that, since she knew she had to find him. Jerboa finds Donnie and shows him the mouse thing, and he's fine with that. Oh, look, you gave birth, our, our child is a mouse. Yeah, for now. The military attacks Thilo's camp and captures the whole group, including Olga. Beckmeyer questions her and wants to know why they do what they do, and she replies that they're being hunted. Beckmeyer hypnotizes Olga and tells him everything. Thilo fills in a few blanks as well. 
Olga is a straight-up werewolf, where Thilo is a were-marsupial. There's some kind of ge- genetic diversity pairing going on here. You get the wolves plus the marsupials making little little half-breeds. Mm-hmm. Weird creatures. Diversity. Take it to the crazy <laughs> point. Jerboa's baby has grown and now looks like a cross between E.T. and a monkey. That was fast. Yeah, yeah, they grow up so fast. In the lab, doctors force Thilo to change into a werewolf. Beckmeyer is bitten. From Thilo's stripes, they identify him as a Tasmanian wolf, a nearly extinct species. The military wants to exterminate them, but Beckmeyer thinks they should be nurtured. They were believed to all be wiped out back in 1910. Beckmeyer releases Olga and Thilo. It's a jailbreak. They head to the outback. Jerboa, Donnie, and the baby are already out there waiting. A bunch of hunters try to track them all down, and they get picked off surprisingly quickly. We see two special government-issued military hunters are on the case, but one of them gets bitten. Philo calls on the Phantom, the great spirit that makes them what they are. The soldiers don't last long now. The Sharp goes to the president and asks him to call off the hunt. Olga and Beckmeyer fall in love, completely forgetting about Thilo. Time passes, and the next thing we see, she's pregnant as well. More time passes, and Jerboa's baby now looks to be about ten, while Olga's baby is now walking. They seem to age very quickly. Jerboa and Donnie go back to civilization, while Beckmeyer and Olga stay on the homestead. Fifteen years pass, and Sharp comes for a visit. Beckmeyer's daughter is now full-grown by this time, and he tells them that it's safe now for them to come back to civilization. The Pope, of all people, has intervened and got the president to stop hunting lycanthropies. A good old Pope. He's, he's pro-werewolf now. I guess so. Another eight years pass, and Jerboa is a Hollywood actress with a different name. Beckmeyer still hasn't found Jerboa and Donnie, and he's back to teaching at the university, while Jerboa's son is one of the students. Everyone watches the Academy Awards as Jerboa wins Best Actress. The flashbulbs make her change on camera. And the cover is blown again. Oh! Ow. Well, if this film is to be believed, it would appear that Australia is the sweatiest place on Earth, but only if you're young and attractive. I've noticed that about a lot of Australian films, though. They do tend to be sweaty movies. Yeah, well, I'm sure it's very yeah. hot there. A lot of desert. But... Mm-hmm, yeah. Gosh. But... but... <laughs> But as the next sentence says, you know, it's a very selective heat. Yeah, if you're old, the old people in this movie look perfectly normal, but yet the young people are all sweaty, drippy, shiny, shiny, sexy looking. Shiny and, yeah. Almost as if the director (laughs) was making a choice there. Glycerin. We need more glycerin. Make these young, beautiful people glisten. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe the hardest thing to believe, though, is they thought Dame Edna would still be a thing 20-something years in the future. She's the host of the Academy Awards. She is immortal. I guess. <laughs> There's an, is she even still around? Is that still a thing? Oh, I don't know if I she is. I haven't seen her since probably the 80s. I don't know if she's still. I, I haven't seen her in ages. Reality says that was a lie. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no ties here at all to the first two films other than the existence of werewolves. None of the characters or places established before appear here. It's just a mo- um, another werewolf movie with the, the title changed. This is kind of dumb. It's really, really dumb. But it's a fun kind of dumb that doesn't drag and has very high production values. The monster masks and makeup are not particularly good, but most everything else was great. A whole bunch of things make absolutely no sense, but if you just roll with it, it's at least entertaining. I liked it. I liked it. Yeah, overall. Yeah. Well, Dame Edna, uh, John Barry Humphreys, is still alive, age 88. Um, and I thought he was British. He actually is Australian. Okay. Yeah. That explains why he's here. Yeah. But I, I can't tell from this if he's still working or, you know. 88's pretty darn old. Yeah, I could still be doing a little stuff, but yeah, I, I yeah. Okay. I, we haven't seen him in a while. <laughs> but, but you know, he could still be doing stuff in England and Australia that us U.S. people never see. True, yeah. 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 All right, and then we watched a short film. Called Pains. Ow! Ow! This is available on YouTube. Watch it for free. And it is 8 minutes, 37 seconds long. Written and directed by Justin Brooks. Stars Emily Bennett. And there's a link to watch it. Uh Uh-huh. What happens? Well, Scarlet wakes up with a nosebleed. 
and she panics and cries. Seems to be that this is something she's experienced before as she kind of appears to be sickly, and then she reaches into her mouth and pulls out a tooth. That ain't good. And that seems to be new for her. She's very surprised. Mm -hmm. She gets a concerned call from her mother, and things spiral out of control from there. Yeah, I thought it was pretty good. It's just one actor Mm -hmm. in a situation that is both common and supernatural. Well, there's the mother, sort of. We don't 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 see see her. her. Yeah, yeah. It's not quite clear what's going on until the end, but there are signs that point in a certain direction that do pay off when it's over. Mm Mm-hmm, yeah. This was yeah. a good one. She's, I wasn't she's sure good. where it was going. I had a theory, and my theory was wrong. And I think you had and, the same theory, a different oh, theory, a that, different was also theory wrong. that was also wrong. Yeah. So it's kind of surprising, and that it's not that surprising. Yeah, it's um, it's um, good though. I mean, you know, she's she's very good, and the the gore, the the blood was very realistic uh-huh. looking, and yeah. All right. Which takes us up to the modern era, twenty twenty two, brand new Hellblazers. Sounds like a, you know, like a superhero cartoon, doesn't it? It does, yeah. <laughs> Written and directed by Justin Lee, stars Ed Marone, or maybe it's Maroney, I don't know. Uh, Crash Buist, there's a name for you, and mm-hmm. Tony Todd. Hour and 24 minutes, trailer in the show notes. And the cover, of course, shows Tony Todd holding a big old hammer in front of a pentagram. And you know this is a Tony Todd starring film. <laughs> well, he's well, in it. <laughs> he's in it. He gets like five lines. So, spoiler free, what happens? Well, they raided the horror actor's retirement home for the cast of this film. <laughs> and, yeah, and the old stars are the main draw here. It's like a 1980s horror film reunion. And on the other hand, once you get past that gimmick... Well, there's not much to the story itself. It's pretty good. It's pretty entertaining. Not really great. It's, you know, it's pretty good. It's all right. It's all right. Yeah. All right. Commentary first this time because it's new and you probably haven't seen it. So this takes place in the 80s, probably so there's no cell phones to deal with. And there's 85-year-old, in reality he's 85 years old, Bruce Dern, who goes around in the film wearing a Vietnam veteran's cap talking about I seen some shit in the war. You know, at 85, and this takes place in the 80s, he must have been like 70 in the war. <laughs> mm, an older guy in the war, I guess. Yeah, yeah. no, I think somebody just didn't do the math. <laughs> Time flies, I guess, even for actors. Courtney Gaines, the hillbilly-looking kid from Children of the Corn and the Burbs, is now playing a grumpy old man who can't keep his dog on a leash. Yeah, you know, after doing the math, that was like 40-something years ago for Children of the Corn. Oof. Wow. Yeah. Tony Todd, Adrienne Barbeau, Billy Zane, Meg Foster, Bruce Dern, John Kassir, and others stop by for quick cameo paychecks, but really the whole thing seems to be a patchwork of scenes involving various old-timers stitched together with the common element, element of Sheriff Joe investigating a group of cultists. Ed Marone has a history of distinct roles, and he's good in this one. He's the sheriff. Yeah. This kind of thing has been done before, but this movie is better than most attempts. What was that one that had all the horror icons down in the prison, way down underground, and there was just nothing to it? It was horrible. Oh, I know I know which one you mean, but I can't think of the name of it. Yeah, and Hell, there, Hell Prison or something like that. And there like were that. the three that were the yeah, top level uh-huh. of, yeah. I can't think of the name right now, but... This is along the same lines, but this is far better than that one. Yeah, yeah. The acting is fine for this type of not quite serious, but not really a parody film, although the pacing does drag a bit towards the end when we run out of guest stars to kill. It becomes a little repetitious fighting cultists who all look alike, which makes them pretty uninteresting, really, even though there seems to be an infinite number of cultists. The monster itself has hints of greatness, but it doesn't really do very much. And we couldn't decide if they simply forgot about Adrian Barbeau's character or if she died off screen for some reason. Yeah, she just suddenly isn't there anymore. Yeah, yeah, she's in it, and they're all in a group, and then suddenly the group leaves, and where'd she go? I think she, I think she died, and yet that scene got cut, if I had to guess. All right, so the spoilery synopsis. Should we do that? With it being so new? Well, some of it. Okay. It's the 1980s. Yes, yes it is. A group of, we're told it's the 1980s. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah, that's about as far as that goes. A group of cultists stand around, I think probably they made the whole movie, Mm -hmm. and somebody said, you know, why don't they just call each other on their cell phones? And then they said like, no, 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 no. this happens in the 80s. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) 
A group of cultists stand around a fire and start a ritual as Joshua leads the group and sacrifices a man. Old Bill Unger is visiting his long-dead wife's grave and hears the sacrifice the group is doing on his property. They all watch as the demon beast crawls out of the fire and towers above Joshua, who reads from the book. Joshua looks surprised that the whole thing works, while Bill tells his dead wife that they've got a big problem. Joe Anderson is the town's new sheriff here from the big city to enjoy the quiet. The deputies discuss rabbit animals and bats, and Deputy Teddy has a crush on Deanna who works at the diner. Harry comes into the diner and wants to know a little bit of the gossip on the new sheriff. Crazy old Bill comes into the sheriff's office and complains about the cultist trespassing on his property. He describes the ritual in long, slow, excruciating detail, including the monster. Sheriff Joe takes some aspirin and wishes he'd stayed home today. He just can't quite keep a straight face through Bruce Stern's exposition. <laughs> like, oh, man, I came here and look at these people. Uh-huh. Well, Sheriff Joe goes to see Georgia, the local radio station's DJ. Adrian Varvo. Yep, she, uh, playing another DJ. She does it quite often. Yeah. She stays on top of all the local news, and she mentions that some guy went missing last night just outside of town. Teddy goes out looking for Bernard's lost dog and sees cultists in the field that vanish when you look away. Elsewhere, Charlie and Eleanor are killed by the demon. Old Bill confronts some cultists, but he's got booby traps and landmines. Boom. And I'll stop there because I don't want to give it all away because you probably haven't seen it. Mm-hmm. And you should. It's all right. It's fun. It's all right. Oh, I thought it was fun. I mean, but... but it's yeah. not a great movie, but it is fun to see all these old characters. Yeah, and there is this period where they're fighting the cultists who, you know, all start showing up and they repetitively keep fighting the cultists. And the problem is all the cultists really they're, honestly they're do, hidden. they they're, all look alike. Yeah, the way they're dressed, they're completely hidden. Yeah. You don't see their faces at all. And, and you don't know how many of them there are, so you don't know if they're doing well or not. I yeah. mean, they killed, you see three cultists be, and they kill all three of them. Oh, well, look, they what? No, there's 50 more of them. I think that'd be my big biggest complaint. That was a little bit tedious. Yes, yes, yeah. it went on for too long. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, and then we have the another 2022 film, The Last Radio Call. Written and directed by Isaac Rodriguez, which stars Sarah Frolich, Jason Scarborough, June Griffin Garcia, Hour and 16 Minutes, and there's a, sh- a trailer on the show notes. I think this one, was this on Shudder? Where did we see this? This was Shudder. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Shudder's got a lot of good stuff. They do. Tubi's got a lot of good stuff. Mm-hmm. A lot of good streaming. you don't have to pay for Tubi. A lot of good Tubi. free yeah. streaming things Yeah, tu- Tubi, you have to watch commercials. Well, but, Shutter's not but it's free. free. Yeah, but it's really but Shutter is a, sub- a subscription. Sh- Shutter's worth every penny. It is, yeah. I mean, if we were getting an affiliate link for Shutter, I'd be pushing <laughs> a little harder. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I definitely recommend it. Uh-huh. All right, so the spoiler-free of the last radio call. the June thir- It's June 30th, 2018, and Officer David Serling went missing inside an undisclosed abandoned hospital. Using his recovered body cam footage, his wife attempts to piece together what happened to him on that horrible night. But this is not a horror movie. This is a documentary. Wink, wink. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. Well, what happens? Well, oh, boy, this synopsis really spoils things. Well, up to a point, up to a point. Yeah, so I'll read a little bit of it. Well, we we see and hear the recordings from police officer David Serling and his partner, Sterling as they go into the abandoned hospital on a call. He and Officer Giles Ali, uh, Giles Giles Ali, Ali. Giles Ali, yes, split up and search different corridors. And David goes into a chapel, and there's a coffin in the middle of the floor. Giles hears screams and gunfire and credits roll. So you figure right away these two cops go into the crazy old abandoned asylum and something gets them. Yeah, well, but there's more. Just gets David, yeah. Yeah. David's wife, Sarah, talks to us about David, and she contacted the filmmakers one year later after his disappearance. She wants to talk about the unsolved missing person's case. They never found a body. David went into Yorktown Hospital where he vanished. Officer Ali was found unharmed but with no memory of what happened. And David's uh, body cam footage was found but cut off early, not showing anything useful. Well, they, the camera crew kind of follows along. Sarah wants you know their help. Uh, you know, they're witnessing of, you know, what she's going through. Uh, she goes to talk to David's supervisor, who resigned a month after the disappearance. He just tells her to leave and get out, get therapy. There's no nothing there at all. 
Well, next she goes to see Giles Ali, who is more cooperative but doesn't really remember, remember anything after a certain point. And more than that, he's basically lost his mind. I mean, he's he's messed up. Yeah, <laughs> Very. Yeah. Well, there's a woman who lives in the area. She recorded an inhuman scream from that hospital at 3 a.m. And thinks that, like, 3 a.m. is some magic time. Oh, it's when the witching hour. Happen. They, they specifically oh, yeah. mentioned 3 oh, yeah. a.m. is the witch. We yeah. looked that uh-huh. up because we both thought the witching hour was midnight. It's It can it be can either. It can be either. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, Sarah goes to the hospital at 3 a.m. just to see if she and the cameraman can hear anything. They try to go inside, but they get busted, get a ticket for trespassing, and she decides to quit the project. Well... I'm going to stop there, I think. Okay. Because she doesn't give it up, and more things happen. No. And it just gets more interesting from they there. They go back to the hospital, and oh, things happen. stuff happens. Yeah, yeah. Boy, does stuff happen. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's not exactly a found footage film, but it does incorporate some found footage gimmicks. And they had, do have the police body cams, mm-hmm. and there's a cameraman following her around throughout the whole thing. It's more of a documentary than a found footage, because... I don't think that the cameraman doesn't die at the end or anything like that, right? This is a real documentary at this point? Yeah. 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 Uh So it's more of a documentary-style story than the typical, you know, everybody dies and we found the camera kind of thing. It has some really nice sets, but the acting, especially from Sarah, is not that great, I didn't think. And here is where I chime in and say, I thought she did a mighty job, good job in that role. Because, I mean, she was, you know, thin, stretched thin at the end of her rope and... Uh, using alcohol to deal with the stress and, you know, the uncertainty of, you know, your spouse disappears, you know, and you don't have an answer, don't know what happened, you know, is he still alive, you know, and if he's not, what happened to him? And she got no closure. And okay. She, 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 and, and I thought she handled that really well and portrayed that really well. You may in, have convinced in, me. In my opinion. You may have yeah. convinced me. Yeah. It's a little slow getting started, but it is pretty entertaining once it gets going. I do recommend it. Mm -hmm. Yep, so do I. All right. So, uh, again, we didn't really spoil the last radio call or the Hellblazers. If you do want to read the whole synopsis, including spoilers, go to horrorguys.com and look them up. They're on there. But we really recommend you see them. Yeah, they are both good. Especially the last radio call. Of the two, I I preferred that one. But they're both good. You see, the pain is good. The howling is good. Uh, we got we got a week. A, a week the of, Horror Express. We like we got five out of, of five. A week of decent movies. We both Thumbs like all up. of these. Thumbs yeah, up on wow, all that, five. That's that's rare. <laughs> 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 okay, very cool. Yeah. We'll stop back next week where we've got more movies coming up. We got some classics and some new ones to talk about. And you I betcha. bet we can fit in another short. And I'm Brian. I'm Kevin. And stop by horrorguys.com/books to pick up our books. Yeah. See, See ya. ya.